Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Hannah Hostick, co-president of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library, and it's a pleasure to welcome here uh, <laughs> everyone here today on this gorgeous Hollywood uh, day. Um, <clears throat> We're going through a little change at uh, the Sterling Road Library. We've begun in-person programs again. It's been a really long two years, and we are delighted that uh, we are able to welcome back people in person to our branch. Right now, the branch hours are somewhat limited, so we're just doing our day programs at the branch. And God willing, with Beam Fur's work and effort right. and energy, right. we will soon have our Sunday hours restored. And Karen, you and I will one day meet again in person, hopefully <laughs> not too long in the future, when we can have these wonderful Hollywood Historical Society programs in person at the library, because we feel right. it's really important to connect in person again. So um, maybe the next time we meet or a yep. few times yep. after that, depending on how effective a Broward County Commissioner Beam Fur is in making this happen. <laughs> we're gonna find before. out. <laughs> okay, we're excited. We're waiting to, to publicize a date. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Karen Albertson, uh, who is the executive director of the Hollywood Historical Society. And I just would like everyone to know that we are recording this program. So if you miss anything, you can see it um, uh, on the Hollywood uh, Historical Society's website and also on the Sterling Road Library's website. Thanks so much. And Karen, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to introduce Beam Fur who is our elected Broward County Commissioner representing District 6, which includes parts of Hollywood, Hallandale Beach, and Pembroke Pines. Beam grew up in the area he now represents and has been a longtime member of the Hollywood Historical Society. Prior to his service on the Broward County Commission, he was elected and served as Hollywood City Commissioner for 12 consecutive years representing Hollywood's District 2. Uh, he was also a teacher at Flanagan High School in Pembroke Pines for many years. Today, we have asked him to talk about the history of Port Everglades, formerly known as Lake Mabel, which was developed by our founder, Joseph W. Young. Um, thank you, Beam, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I know you have quite a busy schedule. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and teach us about our port and all the things that are going on in Broward County. Sure. Well, thank you, Karen, very much. And Hannah, thank you for the invitation to do this. Um, and I'm not a historian, so I, I'm not sure why, why you asked me to do this, but I, I, I took it on. And having been a teacher for a long time, I, I know full well that a lot of times when you're teaching something, you got to go learn it first. And so that's kind of what that in this case, that's a, that's a little bit of what we did. Uh, I have on here is Clay Miller, who uh, is uh, my legislative aide. And both of us went down to the Historical Society up in uh, Fort Lauderdale and got a chance to kind of peruse a bunch of things and, and look over some documents and stuff. I think Clay's mom is a librarian as well and was able to find uh, all kinds of uh, stuff. I really just want, I wanted to find stuff that we hadn't heard because I know that I know most of the people on here probably know a lot of the history pretty well. I know uh, I see Joan on here. So Joan could uh, walk circles around me on, on the historical stuff. So, you know, I, Joan, you'll just have to let me know if we do something wrong on this or do we have something uh, incorrect. Um, but I do see a lot of friendly faces. I just saw Kathy over at uh, Ann Cole Nature Center. So uh, everybody's kind of running around a lot today. But with that, uh, this is going to be, you know, when when uh, Hannah asked and Karen asked um, if we could do the history of Broward County, I'm going, you know, when I thought about it, I'm just going, this is way too big a uh, topic. You know, I, where do I start? And so I decided to start in one place. And so um, if uh, and having to do with water. So if Clay, yeah. uh, we decided to kind of go at it from the water perspective um, and, and how it how things got done there. So I want, I, want, I want you to let, I want you to let your mind wander back to the past 
uh, not the past we typically think of when Joseph Young was building our city and historic sites were being formed. I want you to think back even further when all of Hollywood and Broward County was nothing but a swamp, just a big old swamp. And the land we live on is for the most part a feat of engineering, uh, more than of nature. The natural state of our home is simple. It, it is the Everglades, a mangrove filled swampland. And that's what this area was for, for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, even in 1856, after Florida was already a state for 11 years, uh, the military maps like this one we found clearly shows just how much of the state was a swamp. I don't know if you can see where you know, it says that, but it's, <laughs> they just list it as a big giant swamp. Um, that doesn't mean it wasn't um, unoccupied. For thousands and thousands of years, this state had a massive native and indigenous population including the Tequesta Native Americans uh, who lived here right up until Broward County's development. They are as much a part of our history as anything else. So settlers started moving, uh, arriving in Ernest and Broward County in 1876. Uh, with Henry Flagler's railroad, residents made their way down to swampland in what was then Dade and Palm Beach County. By 1891, there was enough settlers in the area that would become Broward County to create the first post office in the area. And that was a major milestone at the time. In 1893, the Bay Biscayne stage line uh, opened between Lake Worth and Lemon City. I, I, I don't know where Lemon City still is, but maybe, maybe it's there, uh, in Dade County with a stop at the New River in Fort Lauderdale. Um, this brought more residents to the area but what it did do was it ended the barefoot mailman, which probably most people have heard about, who would trudge through seven miles of swamp just to deliver packages. And then after South Florida survived the famous freeze of 1895, it was clear that this area was ripe for development. So Henry Flagler extended the FEC tracks, where hopefully we're gonna have a commuter line in the next couple of years, um, through the area in 1896. New, new settlers started arriving. Swedes in the area that would become Hallandale. Danes in the area that would become, get this, Dania. Uh, Danes in the area that would, uh, across the county, innovative thinkers like Andrew Frost, like Frost Park. And eventually Joseph Young would start looking at our area uh, with a dream. But there was just one problem. It was still a swamp. It was still mostly underwater. Uh, despite the growth and settlement, the area that would become Broward had hit a ceiling. It had too much swamp, too much water, too many mangoes, too many alligators. And uh, so it was hard to go much beyond a few buildings like general stores and post offices. So the potential for mass investment in commercial and residential was, was just not there. The time had come for a big change. By 1900, the area that would become Broward County was stuck in a rut and the Everglades were impenetrable. Despite the growth of the railroad, uh, we did not have the land to build businesses or homes in what would eventually be where we are now, our bustling home. Uh, changing that required a feat of engineering unlike any in the history of the United States of America. Napoleon Bonaparte Broward. He was a man who was very familiar with water. He made his living as a tugboat captain. You don't see those every day. Who helped to grow Jacksonville in the 1870s by transporting passengers through rugged waters. His success in this unique field led him to being nominated for sheriff and then elected to the state house. Imagine someone getting elected today uh, with uh, their resume as tugboat captain. I don't know if that would, it might fly, I don't know. Who knows, we'll have to see. Anyway, after retiring from the house, uh, Napoleon Broward became a salvager in the Florida Keys. On, on, on journeys down the railroads to the Keys, he became obsessed with the Everglades that he regularly just passed by as he, as he was looking by. But he wasn't obsessed in the way a preservationist might be or a naturalist uh, becomes obsessed. All he wanted to do was drain the damn place. Just drain the swamp. He didn't love the Everglades. 
He considered them, and I quote, an abominable pestilence ridden swamp. Uh, not kind words, but he wasn't alone. Uh, across the country, developers looked at the Everglades and saw an area ripe for development. And draining the Everglades, ha it had been considered as far back as 1837. Uh, Congress passed a resolution to consider it in 1842, um, right after Florida became a state. After the Civil War, the internal, this, this you'll see here, the Internal Improvement Fund was formed as a state agency uh, to examine this possibility and spent $4 million purchasing land so that they could move forward. However, the, time, the agency was rife with corruption and unfortunately it's spectac it, was, uh, it failed spectacularly. But Broward was so obsessed with draining and developing the Everglades that he did what any normal person would do he ran for governor. And in 1904, he won a hotly contested race where his main opponent described him as a man of but little ability and not intellectual brilliance whatsoever. Uh, I'm glad they never used that one against me, <laughs> uh, but he won. So uh, he was governor from 1905 to 1909. And at that time, his number one focus was his pet project of draining the Everglades. I would like to see that, that is a bumper sticker. Um, and uh, th uh, this machine, if you look at this picture, there's actually, you can, act there's a, there's a, um, this same machine is actually over in Collier Park, uh, uh, State Park. And it's still, you can still see the whole big thing and it's pretty amazing. Um, after his term began, Broward instituted a land tax through South Florida to pay for the drainage of the Everglades. He faced immense doubts. Really, people didn't know if he could do it. But he was able to convince uh, opponents of his vision by personally financing trips for, from, for legislators, engineers, business leaders to come to South Florida and see for themselves what exactly he had up his sleeve. And in 1905, the Everglades Drainage District was formed to lead the project. Using the money from the taxes that they levied, they used massive, these massive dredging machines to form canals to divert the water uh, in the Everglades. And they also used everything from machines to human labor to clear out the mangroves and other native plants from the areas that had been drained. And so the dredging began on July 4th, Independence Day, 1906, at the New River, New River in the settlement of uh, Fort Lauderdale. And the work was arduous. It took two years just to go six miles. A report was commissioned that found significant issues with the project. The person that managed the report, James O. Wright, was, uh, he was from the USDA's Bureau of Drainage Investigations. He was put in charge of managing the project. And by 1912, over 500,000 acres were available for sale and growing fast. And that was enough to start uh, the real development in Broward County. So in addition to the taxes, uh, large land sales of $15 an acre, imagine that 15 bucks an acre right now. <laughs> uh, it was a fortune at the time, but it helped to fund the project. Uh, these sales showcased just how much interest there was uh, in purchasing land in Broward and in the cities of Dania, Fort Lauderdale, Pompano, Florinata, which was Oakland Park, which is now Oakland Park, uh, they were officially incorporated in the following years. And with the population starting to grow rapidly and a land boom on the horizon, large territory of the drained Everglades made up both uh, Dade County and Palm Beach County. They were, they were cut out to form a new county for development in the region, originally set to be named Everglades County. Um, and I, I think there's some people that, that wish it had been named Everglades County. This county was named after the person who drained it and officially incorporated as Broward County in 1915. Uh, Broward, Napoleon, uh, he, never, he didn't live to see his accomplish, accomplishments play out. Uh, he ran for Senate and was elected in 1910, but he died before he could take office. Uh, within two years of his death, 
the area that he had set out to drain had turned from swamp and said uh, nearly a million acres of canals uh, and land that could be developed. At the time, it was the largest successful drainage project in human history. Uh, but Napoleon was very far from a saint. Uh, he was a no notorious racist uh, who exploited black labor and actively sought to steal and sell the land that belonged to black residents. He proposed the forcible violent eviction of every single black person uh, from the state. He was considered racist even by the standards of that time. So imagine how, imagine that. He was also an arms smuggler and uh, was implicit, in, implicated in some corruption scandals. Because of this, many have suggested changing the name of Broward County and given his vicious racism, uh, there may be a case for that. That's to be seen. We'll, let's, we'll put that on the, on the side for a little while. Um, the draining of the Everglades uh, was not without controversy and setbacks, but during the 1910s, it was clear that the area was primed for a boom. And what it needed was a, vision, a visionary. Uh, that visionary arrived with the most ambitious developer in Broward County's history, Joseph Young. He saw this recently drained land as a place to build his city, his city Hollywood by the Sea. I still like that name. Uh, Hollywood by the Sea was formed in 1920 and incorporated in 1925, uh, very close to that 100th uh, centennial. Uh, we know the history of his vision and the growth of our beautiful city so I'm not gonna go recounting all that. You guys already know, know that uh, without me having to do it. But in the telling of that, his story, we often forget, forget one of his biggest goals. His, he, Joseph Young wanted to make Hollywood a true international destination. And he knew that to do that, he needed what all great cities needed, needed a port. And so he set out to make that investment. Ports are essential to growing cities. They transport needed goods and materials for uh, places to grow. They provide an economic hub for freight to get to businesses and for trade to occur. They provide a prime transportation option for tourists and travelers. And all the great cities of the world have a port or a harbor. And Joseph Young knew this very well. So that is why building a world-class port was always a key part of his vision for Hollywood. At the time, at the time, all uh, freight and <laughs> shut uh, all at the time, all freight and passengers had to make it through the troubled waters all the way down to Miami, and, or they took a long, kind of uncomfortable train ride down there. Joseph Young knew that a port would fix these problems and give a, give a major economic and resource boost to his city, Hollywood by the Sea. So city officials and staff at the time, they all agreed. At a time when other cities were not ready to make that kind of an investment, Hollywood took the lead in creating a port for the rapidly growing Broward County. And with that investment, there was no looking back for Broward County. At the time of Hollywood's founding, the area just north of Dania, was a there was a natural body of water there called Lake Mabel. Uh, this was like a swampy area that was not, it wasn't ready for development. Uh, in 1911, the Florida Board of Trade passed a resolution to call for a deep water port. And in order to facilitate this, the dredging occurred in 1913 by the Fort Lauderdale Harbor Company that, it, that formed the Lake Mabel Cut, which was still a large lake, but a more developed one than, and, and less of a swamp. So despite this progress, work stopped for a decade on actually creating the port. But that changed in 1924. After four years of rapid growth and transformation, Joseph Young, he was ready for Hollywood to take the next big step. So looking at his original plans for the city, a harbor or port was always a part of his plan to achieve the vision for Hollywood as a boom town. Uh, and after watching nothing happen with the Lake, Lake Mabel cut when they were, they just didn't get it going, he worked with city staff to make something happen himself. That's the kind of guy he was. 
1924, Young bought 1,440 acres of land that's adjacent to the Lake Mabel Cut. Cost him a little over $2 million. And then he formed the Hollywood Harbor Development Company. And that was incorporated, uh, which incorporated many of the leading mines and residents of Hollywood at the time. These are some of our fine citizens at the time, right here. In 1925, development on what then was, what was then being called the Hollywood Harbor began. Uh, Young hired labor, lumberjacks uh, from as far north as Vermont uh, to clear the land. He used dredging machines to turn Lake Mabel into less of a swamp. Um, he funded all of this through $2 million in improvement bonds, much like our GEO bond that we just did that the residents of the city overwhel overwhelmingly approved. Um, I wonder if they had an oversight committee back then. I don't know if they do or not. <laughs> uh, not all the residents loved it though. Uh, anecdo anecdotes at the time described all the infernal noise and the bar fights from the laborers that, brought, that, that were brought in. But for the most part, the harbor had the support of the residents and the city. Unfortunately, the great hurricane of 1926 stalled progress severely. It caused damage of one and a half billion dollars and drove many residents away. Among them was Joseph Young. However, by then, uh, the city of Hollywood was committed to this investment, as were many other private financiers. Uh, they asked the Florida legislature uh, for a special act to create a port authority. And in 1927, the Broward County Port Authority was formed to manage this project. And Hollywood's, Hollywood's continued resolve, uh, despite the hurricane, helped to make all of this possible. And the work continued as fin financiers uh, produced a booklet to advertise the new port to businesses and cruise lines and tourists from across the country. And despite the immense hurricane setback, the port project was finally completed. And on February 22nd, 1928, the port project was completed uh, and the entire county closed down and 85% of the residents uh, in the county came to celebrate with President Calvin Coolidge uh, to officially dedicate what was now called Bay Mabel Harbor. And there's, a, uh, there's the headlines of the day. Um, the dedication was uh, supposed to be capped. Um, can you, yeah, here's the headlines right there. Um, the dedication was supposed to be capped off by a grand, big grand gesture. And President Coolidge was supposed to press a button uh, in the White House that detonated explosives to remove the, the rock barrier separating the harbor from the ocean. Unfortunately, <laughs> the explosives did not, didn't go off that day. And uh, the spe all the spectators were, were left a little disappointed. Not that different from when we had July 4th the other, a couple of years ago and all the, and the, we didn't have fireworks. So not that, not that different, but uh, anyway, it was an inauspicious start for the Harbor. Uh, despite this, uh, things would get much better, uh, but the new Harbor uh, needed a, a new name. Bay Mabel Harbor, it just wasn't gonna cut it. Uh, wasn't grand enough for Hollywood uh, or the financiers. So, th so all of the women's clubs in Broward County, led by the Hollywood Women's Club, uh, held a renaming contest. And after many entries, consensus was reached on a new name, uh, Port Everglades. And that's how we got our name. And the first ocean-faring cargo ship uh, to dock at Fort Everglades was the SS Boatland a German ship, uh, the USS Antares was, was also in 1929, was the first military ship to dock in Port Everglades. And the dedication of the port inspired Broward County officials to invest in the first airport in the area, which opened in 1929. With a port and airport in hand, Hollywood now had two features that defined every great county. And we're, we're probably one of the very few that have them really right so close to each other. And uh, it is, it is work to our benefit. Initially growth at the new port 
was slow due to the lasting impacts of the great hurricane. But by, by 1931, the first cruise line was sailing out, uh, the fun named United Fruit Company. <laughs> there's, the, there's the first one right there. It was sailing out uh, in 1931. And it was also the year that large amounts of petroleum started to arrive at the port. So bo both the cruise industry and the, and the petroleum started at the same time. In 1932, Wayne Eller, think Eller Drive, um, became the first manager of the port. He emphasized bringing a bunch of bulk commodities into the port like cement, uh, grain, various metals, all kinds of stuff. So in addition, despite the Great Depression in the 1930s, the port continued to increase tugboat and passenger operations. And then from 1941 to 1943, Port Everglades served as a base and a training facility for the United States Navy and, and Coast Guard. Uh, the military considered it a crucial Atlantic military base. It was subject to offshore attacks by the German U-boats, U um, uh, which led to surrounding homes being blacked out at night during that time and armed men patrolling the shoreline. I wasn't there at the time, but uh, I have heard people that lived at that, that time heard about that. Um, after the war, uh, when Port Everglades really began to boom, uh, right, you had ra rapid urban and suburban growth, growth. That inflated the population of Broward County in the post-war years. And with the development came immense growth uh, for the port. And the cargo increased from 3.3 3 million uh, tons to 5.6 million tons, an increase of 52% in just a few years. And cruise passengers doubled in the 1950s. And this is when the Fort Lauderdale Ro Rotary Club uh, began the famous tradition of greeting passengers with orange juice as they got off the ships and to give them a Florida welcome. In the 1960s, uh, we had six new cruise terminals were built. And there were so many cruises that the port began circulating their well-known cruise guides throughout the entire country. Uh, the 1960s also saw the Cuban Missile Crisis, which began a new military buildup at the port. Uh, perhaps most iconically, the 1960s also saw the building of the smokestacks of FPNL, which were later, which were demolished not that long ago. Uh, I think eight years ago in, in 2013. Uh, the, 20, the, the 70s and 80s uh, saw more innovations and, uh, as the port became an official foreign trade zone for the first time. And the rail mounted uh, container, these container gentry cranes also opened and allowed more freight to be carried than ever. Uh, they also, little known fact, uh, these actually inspired George Lucas to create the at at walkers from the Empire State Strikes Back. So who knew, who knew? We may have to check that one. <laughs> Might have to talk to George on one, but that's, that's what I heard, that's what I heard. Um, the, uh, the last 30, ser 30 years have seen broken records and, and just incredible progress. Uh, 2015 saw an expansion of the port that continues to this day. In 2016, the port broke the Guinness World Records for port passengers in a single day with over 55,000 in one day. And it's clear that the port has come a long way since Joseph Young's uh, initial, initial investment. Our city and our, and our county is really defined very much by, the, by its growth. Hollywood's not the first city of Broward County. Dania Beach came before it, Pompano Beach came before it, Fort Lauderdale came before it, Davy came before it. Port Everglades is, is not um, uh, just a nice place to catch a cruise. It's what we call in government, this is an economic engine. Uh, it is responsible for $34 billion of direct revenues in Broward County. It's the linchpin of 232,000 jobs. It is one of the leading passenger and cargo points in North America and growing faster than ever. There's, there's 3,006 counties 
in the United States of America, 67 of them in Florida, of all the counties in the United States of America. From sea to shining sea, Broward County is the 16th largest. Uh, it will probably get to the top 10 uh, sometime within the next gener in a generation or two. Why? What makes us different from Vero Beach or Martin County or Port St. Lucie or even Palm Beach? Why did we turn into a global metropolis instead of a mid-sized county? The answer is simple, Port Everglades. Uh, it has functioned, it has functioned as an internationally recognized international economic engine. And that is a difference maker. Port Everglades growth turned our county from a sleepy resort area into a true metropolis. And the growth of the port brought business that led to the boom of downtown Hollywood and to Fort Lauderdale. Without the port, we would not have our airport, uh, which is one of the 15th largest in the country now. With the airport, we have two unstoppable economic engines. We also have developed in a ways that takes advantage of our natural terrain, our water, our canals, in a way that is unlike anywhere else. Simply put, Broward County is Broward County because of Port Everglades and all that grew from it. And Port Everglades and all that grew from it only exists because of the city of Hollywood. Uh, we weren't the first city, but we were the, probably the most important city. A uh, little bias here. There might be a little bias here. It's okay. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure my, my Fort Lauderdale commissioners, friends would say no, but take that. Uh, just look at the history that, that we've recounted. The acres bought by Joseph Young, $2 million that were invested to create the port, the Hollywood Harbor Development Company that pushed it along, the city that developed it, from lumberjacks to administrators. Port Everglades exists because of Hollywood. And Broward County is only what it is because of Port Everglades. If you can draw a direct line uh, between Hollywood's bold leadership and the, and the Broward County boom of today. In addition, Hollywood's growth was cited as a key reason to build the first airport in 1929, like we mentioned. And that's why the airport still bears the name of Hollywood to this day. So Hollywood's city beautiful design style, uh, design style around the lakes, the intercoastal, the canals, and a grid system has not been replicated anywhere. And I don't know if we're, and this is one thing that we never take credit for. It is actually built on some astronomical guidelines. And I always like to throw this out there. When Joseph Young did, did his grid, he did it so that the sun would set on Hollywood Boulevard, on the vernal equinox and on the autumnal equinox. He wasn't thinking in terms of people driving. <laughs> so on that day, when you're driving into the sun and you can't see anything, just think about that. Um, but but uh, large, anyway, large parts of the county, especially uh, the large cities of Weston and Coral Spring, they've used Hollywood's blueprint in their own development. Uh, Hollywood may not have been the first city in Broward County, but it certainly looks like it was the most influential. And from the port to the airport to our waterways, Hollywood is a city that gave Broward County the tools to go from a quaint curiosity to a regional powerhouse. History is always being written. In 100 years, we are still going to be talking about the port and our unique relationship to water. Uh, fortunately, we have so many exciting things coming to the port and to the surrounding areas. We're on our way back to the pre-pandemic levels in terms of the number of cruise passengers at the port, and we're almost back to normal levels of freight. And this is great news that uh, will continue to drive our decade of growth. And within a few years, you, you've, if you've been over there lately, you'll probably see that we're, we're, we'll, we're in the middle of uh, building a big uh, hotel right there, a port hotel, and the convention, convention center is expansion, is ex expanding. Uh, that's good. That building of a truly iconic hotel and the upgrading of the convention center is gonna make sure that we're competitive with the other large cities that will provide us with world-class facilities uh, needed to truly host the biggest of events. And to handle freight, these are our newest uh, additions. We have three super post Panamax, Panamax, Panamax cranes 
uh, and an intermodal container transfer uh, facility means they, now they, these, these guys can pick it, pick it right up and then put it right on the train, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, and if you just go to, if you can see past this picture a little bit further, you see where there's a, another big expansion project called the Southport uh, Turning Notch Expansion Project. And that's so these really, really big new boats uh, are able to go down there and turn around and then come back out. Um, so there's some pretty, pretty amazing stuff in the, in the works. In terms of moving passengers, uh, we're hoping to have a commuter rail station at the airport. And these are the stations that have been picked and Hollywood is one of them. If you can go down just a little bit, there it is. Um, uh, and hopefully we, we see that in a couple of years. I'm hoping that uh, uh, you will be able to jump on a train, either go to the airport or all the way down to Wynwood and down to Miami and the whole bit. Um, using uh, money from the geo bond and the infrastructure bill and our blueprint in the climate change action plan, uh, we're going to be managing water through building seawalls, uh, investing in our drainage system, creating new standards to adapt to, flo to flooding, and a whole lot more. Uh, perhaps most magical of all, Disney is now going to be sailing out of Port Everglades uh, within the next two years. That's a, that's a, uh, a big event because uh, Brightline, as most of you all probably now know, is the railroad is actually going to be going from uh, uh, to, from Fort Lauderdale to Orlando. And the idea is to pull all the European um, visitors that come to Disney World and then immediately get on the train, come right down here and jump right on the ship. So that, had, that bodes well for a lot of businesses, hotels, um, the, whole, the whole bit. Um, so it's, it's expected to bring un, unprecedented business and tourism to our area. So the, the, the future is bright. Uh, we're gonna face some regional challenges like climate change in the years to come. But overall, I think we have the tools to write the best chapters uh, for Broward County uh, ever. These tools exist because of Hollywood and it's clear that Hollywood is the history that makes, makes history. And so I'll, with that, I will uh, be happy to take any questions and hopefully Clay can answer them. <laughs> if okay. not, we're gonna, if not, Joan can. So uh, I, I, I do want to say this was a, a fun kind of project for, for us to um, uh, kind of dig into and hopefully you all enjoyed that. Hi, Howard Frank here uh, in Hollywood. Uh, hey, Howard, how you doing? Okay. Uh, the airport is doing great. And uh, the biggest problem is, believe it or not, it all boils down to not enough baggage handling. So there are three areas where they're at the terminals where triple parking, the police can't do anything. I lodged a complaint with uh, the sheriff and uh, it's the baggage handlers in the airport. You got three flights coming in, like at uh, Terminal 3, where Gate 10 is a mile away almost from the and it backs up the whole airport. So I've made a larger complaint on the parking because they keep chasing everybody, but they have to chase the baggage handlers. And the whole airport would run a whole lot smoother if the baggage was expedited. So if you I will, can say, I, will I, I will relay that to the airport director. And I know there's we're in the middle of some master plans for the airport where this is going to be a people mover all the way around it, which is going to and, and parking is going to be changing. So there's some, there's some big plans afoot, but in the meantime, I will let him know that, okay? Thank Happy you. To do that. Yep. you did a great job, it's a pleasure. You have to come out back and tell us better stories next time, thank you. Okay, Happy. thank you. I, I have a couple, I have like three questions, I think, Beam. I'm gonna, I'm, you know this stuff better than me, Clive, come on. Well, I'm asking you <laughs> stuff that I don't know that I think you probably know, so there you go. But thank okay. you very much. This was very interesting. I actually learned some stuff that I didn't know. Um, about the county, but I know that I think 80% of Port Everglades is actually in the city of Hollywood, which I yep. have never had an opportunity to tell people that. Yeah. Um, but what I don't know is what kind of economic benefit does Hollywood get because of that fact? Do we get any tax revenue? What do we get for that? Um, 
I think you still get tax revenue, but it, but it, when it changed from being a port authority to going under the county commission, uh, there was a, a deal, and I think it was in 1994, where things changed. And uh, I, I, I think there was a, a, at the time, Hollywood got a lot of money um, for that kind of exchange on some. And I don't know all the, this, that, this all by itself would be, I think, a, um, that whole exchange would be uh, a whole uh, issue by itself to, to, to look under. I know Jamie Cole was the attorney at the time, and it was a, it was you know they looked at I think Mayor Galanti was the mayor, and it was a you know I think the city benefited a lot through a lot of money at the time. I don't know exactly now how much tax revenue, but I'll, I'll try to find that out. It's yeah, my chamber, the leadership program, Hollywood Chamber of Commerce brings the leadership program to Port Everglades, and I, you know, tell them about the history of Joe Young starting it, and a couple of people have said, well, what do we get for that? And I said, you know, I don't know, so. Right. I would love to tell the class what it is. And the other question I had is how much of Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport is in Hollywood? And, and is there any part of that that's in Dania? A lot of it's in Dania. Um, I, I, I mean, I think the, the southern part. Uh, how much? I don't know. I don't know the answers to those either. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if Hollywood is, in, is actually in the I don't know if it, the airport's actually in Hollywood. I'm yeah, thinking I, it, I don't think I don't, it is. Okay. But I think it, it, it was able to maintain the name because Clay, Clay. I'm, I'm, I'm so gonna... the vast majority of uh, the airport is actually in unincorporated Broward County. Uh, it's in that area between Griffin Road and between Snyder Park. That area is mostly unincorporated. So that's why if you go to a place like the field or the Royal India, they'll tell you, oh, we're in Dania, we're in Hollywood, and, but their address is either Hollywood or Fort Lauderdale, depending on what city they're closest to at the time. I think most of them use Fort Lauderdale, but that area is actually, for the most part, unincorporated with a portion of Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Okay, and the third and final question, when I, I saw the map of the, of the Metro um, like service, like a tri-rail service on the FEC corridor, yeah. and it looks going to be Tyler Street or Taylor Street, Polk Street. When right do they in, in Hollywood? Yeah, we're going to get a station, right? Yep. Now, when do they anticipate that happening? What's the the there's a lot of negotiations negotiations that are taking place with Brightline right now. Uh, my hope is that we're able to extend uh, because Miami Dade's a little ahead of us. Uh, they are actually planning on going to be up in Aventura within two years. I'm, at, I'm trying to have, the, have there be an extension of what they're doing go up to Port Lauderdale. The big issue right now has to do with how do you get over or under the New River? And I, I'm sure you've been seeing the discussion as to what, and there's a, there's a big discussion on that. That's not gonna happen for a while. But the Southern phase, I think, I actually think there's a possibility of it happening within two to three years. We could have a station in Hollywood and go to Miami. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Nice. That's my, that's if, if we can get the, the extension from what they're doing and if we can get all our negotiations in place, uh, Brightline, that's what Brightline has said to me. Excellent. Okay. Commissioner Fur, when you were doing your research on this project, was there anything in particular that inspired you or touched you or might have an impact on you know, some direction that you take in the future in terms of policy? Is there anything in particular or? Well, it, it, when I saw, you know, when I see all the, uh, what they're doing with the Everglades, when they're doing all the, uh, the digging of the canals, you know, it just makes you recognize, be careful what you're doing and some, you know, and how you do it. Obviously we wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened. But now, you know, now we're spending billions and billions trying to, reclaim a lot of those things so you, you have to it, it just was made it perfectly clear to me be careful what you're doing when you're messing around with nature on you know i think that's the that is the big takeaway from a lot of things like that um because it's you know it, it takes a lot to put it back into place well, there are a few comments, really. Um, I don't know if you'll have a chance to see them later, but uh, quite a few people have thanked you so much 
you and Clay for doing incredible research and for a really interesting uh, presentation. Are there any other questions other than what we've seen that we saw in the chat? Let me just thank Clay right here because he did a great <laughs> job on this. And, and it was, I think he had a fun, I think he had some fun doing it. You know, when I, when I was a teacher, I would always tell people if I didn't know what I was talking about a lot, I said, I'm on page 33, just catch me, <laughs> you know? And, you know, in this case, I was, you know, I'm just a little ahead of where, where he was, but, but uh, Clay, he did a fantastic job on this. Thank you, Clay. Thank you. It was, it was an honor to do and the four time uh, winner of the Broward County F History Fair has finally returned to defend this title. So it was, it was a pleasure. No, it, it was seriously, it was great. And, and thank you for the vision and really helping to organize the thoughts and of how you wanted, what thesis you wanted to get across so I could help fill in the details. I want to in thank you both. Sorry, go on. Sorry. Yeah, in doing it, what we really, there were some things we did not get to get to because we really wanted to dig into the South Florida Water Management District annals and see how, what, how, and how do they decide where to build the canals and all those kind of things. Because really the history of the state is a history of water. Um, so we didn't get into to some of the things we wanted to, but another time, another time. What I really appreciated was the, the slide that had um, the words, richest soil in the world, deep muck. It was yeah. like, okay, yeah. <laughs> that, that really <laughs> captured a lot for me. It in does, terms it of is. Broward County. <laughs> Nothing so. but neat, deep muck. <laughs> Deep mug. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, well, um, uh, someone asked if the recording will be available for the public. Of course, everything we do is available to the public, free and open. So you can check out the Friends of the Sterling Road Library's website and also the Hollywood Historical Society's website and watch this at your leisure and share it with your friends and remind them all that anyone born in, what was it being, anyone born in Broward County can have a library card? Is that? The, yeah, the uh, Library for Life. Library uh, for Life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you were born in Broward County, uh, the Broward County makes sure that no matter where you're living, you don't have to be living in Broward County, but you are a library card member for the rest of your life, even if you're in, in the top of the Himalayas. So. Okay, great. Um, uh, I, I, again, I, I, I'll make sure that you see these comments because there are a lot of compliments. So, and let um, me just say, if, if you're not a member of the Friends of Sterling, Sterling Road, you're missing out because they do, you guys do the best. This is the best friends group anywhere. They, I, they put on all kinds of programming for, for everyone. They let everybody know. They bring in all these great projects. They, they had an art tour a couple of weeks ago. It's just fantastic. Um, so if you haven't joined, join. Thanks, Commissioner Fur. We take yeah, that yeah. as an official endorsement. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, great. So uh, Karen, do you yeah. wanna end the program? Yes, I just wanna say thank you very much, Beam. That was very informative. And I've been here since I'm three. So I learned a lot as well. Um, I just wanted to mention that next month's lecture that was Clive Taylor about the hurricane of 1926 has been changed um, from the 3rd of April to the 24th of April. There was a conflict, we were doing the walking tour and this came up. So he's graciously said that he would do it on the 24th. So tune in and you'll get a flyer regarding that change of date. And Beam, you were just great. I really appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great to okay, see everybody we, on here. A lot of good well, people on here. We also look forward to seeing everyone in person one day soon. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Furr, we can't wait to hear an announcement that will make that a reality so that um, you know we'll, we'll be able to spend Sundays at the library. We're working on it. We're working on it now. Okay. Sounds okay. great. Okay. okay. Thank you all. Enjoy you all. the rest of your day. And um, we'll see you next month. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat>